Okay. Um, so the next 50 minutes, this is it. This is the time commitment. The next 50 minutes, we're going to do a variety of things. We're going to intermingle three stories uh, from three objects that were donated. And you're going to hear the story. It's going to come alive right in front of us, which is going to be really kind of cool. And in between that, we're going to hear from Diane, who, who is from a curational, did we say that the right way? Cur curator's perspective. Uh, we'll give her a slam diet. So now we've got the person who's donating it, and then its relevancy to the town of Chester. And then, in between all that, will be a little bit of background, and not as much that you need it, but as ambassadors of the historical society, the people who have a passion for Chester, is how does this historical society acquire? How does it accept, that it's just, you know, to accept anything? How do they store it? How do they maintain it? How do they preserve it? for the next generation. And that's intermingled a lot of different aspects, but if we're talking about building uh, what we have in terms of support, in terms of the actual items, there's a limited supply. We don't know where they all are. So by engaging the public to say, hey, that thing that's been in the corner that my grandfather gave you that we've been dusting off, we're gonna, you know, what is that? And then to realize that it's got significance. Or for the people who are no longer in town, Chester used to have, everyone used to stay in town, now they don't. So what was handed off to generation to generation stayed in town. Now it is, just goes. And sometimes it comes back. But if we can alert people and educate them that what they have is actually something that maybe a value to the town, maybe not financially valuable, maybe financially valuable, they'll accept all kinds of things, um, that uh, we may be able to first identify in advance things that uh, bar of interest and start that dialogue and have people say, hey, you know what? That sign I've had that was my grandfather's sign, <coughs> uh, I, what am I going to do with that? You know? Bring it in. And, and so this will go well beyond the, today's kind of exercise, but this is a kind of neat informational thing. So the way we're going to do it is we have three people, uh, uh, Dick Savani, who's going to be first up, Marilyn Malcarney, uh, then Don Kroll, and we'll do a quick, like six minutes of them talking about what it is, why it's special, the history, and all that. Um, and then there'll be a quick Q and A, like a couple minutes, because otherwise it'll go on forever. Then we'll have Diane talk about it from her perspective, from the museum's perspective. Then we'll go on to the next one. Okay. So with that in mind, the first one, uh, Dick, where are you? You just walked in. Into, into not. There you are. Do you want to come on up here and, and talk about this? And is there something you want to control this with? Well, I was just going to say about this. This shows some of the different things. The mic's not. I don't think the mic's on. You it want does. the light you want on? It? You want the mic? Okay. Doesn't matter. Yeah, just. Do you want this light on? For now? That sure. help for Dick and Diane Yeah. Okay. Is that all right? Okay, to illustrate some of the ways that people have donated things, the picture in the back of the uh, class of 1938 at the Chester High School came from my cousin who was moving out of town. And so he dumped all his old pictures at the Historical Society. Um, the tools, which are in the upper left corner, came from Bruce Watrous, who's lived here for generations, and they came from his great-grandfather. And there's actually a display of them over there if you want to look at them afterwards. Um, down in the lower left is a receipt from um, a tizzy, which came from uh, Butch Lavazzoli, who also moved to Florida. And as he left, he brought a lot of the Chester things that had been in his family that wouldn't have significance to people in Florida. <laughs> so he brought a lot of those things in for us. And the, the item in the middle, which is a 19, excuse me, 1888 dance card for something called the Quiet Young Fellows. And it's, it's a really cool dance card. Came to us from eBay. Somebody bought it on eBay and shipped it to me. I have no clue who it is. They shipped seven other things also, which were really cool Chester items. Thank you if you're out here, and I don't know who did it. So. Okay, so if we so the idea there is that you may not you may have some of the stuff in your drawers in your kitchen or in your basement 
bizarre little things that have been hanging on forever, and they're all they're of significance to us. Is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's the point there. Dick, do you want to talk about your the chest? That's uh, that's the old timer that was uh, given to my father by Ray Bellows, who owned the Pratt House, uh, probably around 1950. Was in my father's house for well over 40 years, and has been in our house for the well, last 30 some years. Uh, it's it's signed inside by Samuel. Solomon, you know, you barely read the writing anymore, but well, it is, it is legible. You may be able to catch it on the top right. You see the script up there? Yeah. You, when, you, when you see it close, you can see it. But it is pencil. It is fading out. And I just thought you folks should have it so that you can document what it is and maybe preserve the writing. But how it got from Deacon Samuel, so who was the master craftsman that built the Dr. Pratt's house, and then his son was Samuel C. But he would have only been 11 or 12 years old at the time the Pratt house was built. It's amazing that that's still here, considering where the Pratt house ended up. Yeah, I saw it. It probably was. I'm just assuming that it was probably in the Pratt House all that time. <coughs> Those sold the house, Pratt House to the Catholic Church somewhere around 1950. And it may have been at that point that they gave that chest to my father because he brokered the negotiations between the Catholic Church and the Bellows family. So, so from a curator's perspective, how does the historical society view a piece like this, and what 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 perked your interest in that? What well, well, it's you know obviously Silliman is a huge name in Chester with the Silliman factory and Samuel Silliman being the builder that built a number of houses in town, and I know that his son Samuel C. Also Carlos was another person that built and did a lot of things in town. And so anything that's a physical thing that was part of their, you know, this was his tool chest, which all his building tools would have been in. So it's, it's I thought it was really important. And that signature, you probably can't make, can you see it at all on the top mm -hmm. right? No. Mm -hmm. It's not a very good picture. No, it's not, but it, you can see it, which probably just adds a little spice to the whole thing. It certainly, certainly says who's it, who's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for that. Can we ask a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, so go ahead. We have a question. I'm a little confused. Is the owner of this toolbox the person who founded the Silver Inkwell factory? Yeah, well, yes. Samuel C. Sullivan. C. Well, who was the one before? That was, that was his father, was Deacon Samuel Deacon. Sullivan. Okay. He's, he is the master carpenter that built. So, so the father was the house builder as opposed to the son that founded the factory? No. 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 Samuel, the house builder, later founded Silliman Company, and his son was very involved in the company. Samuel Carlos. I'm just trying to find out which one of these fellows built my house. In 1807. Who would that be? That would have been Samuel, Deacon Samuel, the so, senior. The senior. Right, because right. Samuel and C was not born until like 1809. Well, the house was 1807, so yes. it had to be Yes, yeah, so <laughs> that's how Samuel Silliman Sr., or the deacon, got his start, was building houses. He built your house, he built the, the red house. house. The red house on the porch. Yeah, so he built all those and eventually took his skills at handcraft to make the company that made all the inkwells. Amazing. And his son was alongside him. His son also was building and working in the factory with him. So we don't know when this was signed, whether his father built the tool chest and he signed it later, whether he built the tool this chest. signed Samuel C? It's signed Samuel C. Samuel C. Yeah. Okay. So we, we don't know the timeline. And also, like, the Pratt House was probably not built 
in like six months. It would, took a while, and I'm sure that some of the fine work was done, you know, later. It didn't all happen in, in one year, probably. Did Dick have more to add? Look like you had another comment to make on it. No, no, you sure? It's a great it's, gift. It's, it's a mystery mm -hmm. <laughs> how it ended up staying in the house and how Sandra C ended up with it. Yeah. Stick. Stick was it? I assume it's a standard. If there is a standard size like toolbox, I mean, yeah. it's probably it's four and a half by foot. No, no, small, probably. 38 inches yeah. or so wide. Okay. And, and was your dad a craftsman? Or a craftsman? <laughs> yeah, he was a builder. Okay, so it was well, very, very, very appropriate. To yeah, be well, that may be the reason that fellows gave it to him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did he ever use it? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 To use it, it was used for blankets and such because all the time I grew, remember it, it was in a walk-in closet in our right. house on Price Street. And it was in there, and it was full of blankets or that type of thing. <laughs> he, he had his own favorite tool chest. Oh, yeah. 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 Joel? Yeah. Joel? Yeah. My house has a plaque on it. It was built in 1835. So that fit in with it. Yeah. Cycle. Yeah. Yeah, that was his, his house. Oh. Samuel C.'s house. Yes. Oh. Okay. Oh. His house. S.C. Silman on the side. Mm -hmm. Another question? Thank you, Dick. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Now, this is the, uh, the interlude is to read in information. Again, you may all know all this, but again, as the word goes out, we want to make the information available on, through social media or whatever so people can learn more about how to do what we do here. Uh, that's part of the reason for now having a, a, a discussion on this. Yeah, this is the ball upstairs in the mill. When the mill was built, we have two um, climate controlled vaults. This is the upstairs one where we store our objects. Um, some of the boxes have quilts, some of them have dresses. Um, you can see that we have some paintings hung up. This is where all the objects go that we have. Obviously, you can also see that's a very small space. So that's something that we consider when we're thinking about donations. I mean, I have a place for this chest that Dick brought, but we don't have a lot of storage space. So that's an ongoing discussion that we have about maybe finding more space. We also have a vault downstairs in the mill that has more um, books and paper or uh, ephemera stuff in it. And we have storage space downstairs here, and you certainly are welcome to come visit me anytime and see what that looks like. Here it is right there. <laughs> yes. So um, now we go to the next one, but is uh, oh, yeah. is yeah. relevant. Yeah. Oh, okay. hi. Oh. Hey. Come on come up. On up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So you want to talk to us about uh, about this nice base grow? Yes, this was Jim Grove, James Lewis Grove, just a little guy he used to say. Yeah. That was his base drum. And this oh. base drum is huge. I mean it is huge. And the last time grandpa used that, he was in his mid-80s. And the muster had an award for the oldest person marching. And Grandpa was bound and determined to win that award. <laughs> so the entire parade, some poor kid from Chester, bent over backwards, and Grandpa had the drum on him, and they marched the whole parade. So that's the only time I got to see Grandpa oh, march. I don't know. I would love to find that out. I thought it was so funny. And uh, Grandpa belonged to the drum corps for many years, as did my father, Carmine. And we believe it is a Harold Watrous, who was a drum maker out of uh, Moodis, a really fine drum maker, but I would like to clarify that even more. Um. And I gave it to the Chester Historical Society because I was honestly considering giving it to the Company of Fifers and Drummers, which is a museum down in mm -hmm. Iverton on Just Fight and Drum Corps, but in my heart I kept saying, 
Chester. It belongs in Chester. Mm -hmm. And how many people are going to donate the drum? And the uni I also donated his uniform, which I had used a number of times, so that you have both sets. Mm -hmm. And that's why Chester got it, because it belongs home. That's great. Mm -hmm. And what's really great is that it's, it's, a, it's a part of the family heritage. Yes. And it's also part of the community heritage. And yes. you're recognizing that, hey, you know what? This is home. Yeah. Yeah. And my it's sister had gotten it originally, and she was going to turn it into a table. And when she said this to me, I just said, this cannot happen. So then I had it for a number of years, and I turned and donated it. Last year. Any questions? That's mm -hmm. great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And I have to admit, I was such a, I thought this started at 6 o'clock. Oh. So when I just discovered 5 o'clock, I came running in here. But I have a picture in my car that I'm going to bring in at the end. And it's a picture of George Watrous, Carmine Watrous, Phil Watrous, and Carmine Grove. Carmine Grove. Yeah. yeah. And one more Watrous. Right. And it's them being uh, George. George Watkins. Yes, George is the flag bearer, and then Carmine is the viper, and then Phil and his brother Phil are the Arnold. Arnold. Yeah. Are, are marching in their um, the Corps of 1776. Oh, it's a great gift. And they were like teenagers. Wow. Oh. So I, I had a larger picture blown up, and okay. I'm going to bring it to you. Okay. And there's also a picture of Grandpa at the company hall. Huh in one of the original uniforms where they look like they were in a band uniform. Oh, okay. And I'm going to get a copy of that and bring it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I just think it's a, a great donation. I mean, the minute we got it, we stepped it right up to the exhibit because it, it fit right into our exhibit where the, uh, the drum corps and all that sort of stuff. I mean, this is something that was like from the 1800s, that yes, is part yes. of our town, and it has so many people associated with it. So, and you didn't great. have one. You didn't have another drum. We didn't have another Chester drum. No. Well, do you know how long uh, Jim was with the drum corps? When did he join it? He he joined it. I was trying to figure that out. I would assume in the 1910s, 1920s. Wow. And then he marched, the and, last and time he marched was when he was 85. And he would have been, what, 20 years old then or so? Yeah. yeah. So 65 years maybe in the drum corps? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Those, you know what, size doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you hit that drum, you can be five foot tall, you hit that drum and you can hear it. John, you used to play in the pipe and drum, didn't you? There's a picture of me. Uh, <laughs> this is what's really weird, and we all have to consider this. Is what do we have at home? You know, it falls into two categories, doesn't it? The stuff that was given to you by your parents, it was never yours to start off with, and you're just caretakers. And the other one is what we all have growing up, some of this stuff. Um, and just as an aside, I'll, I'll put the, the, the uh, uh, there's a couple things that, that uh, didn't make the show this time around, and we're going to talk about what's relevant. Um, oh, I'll, I'll pull this out here. You'll see, see what this is. <laughs> like, it'll be kind of a, 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 an amusing little tidbit. But with, there's a picture of me with Jack Broken had taken. Uh, and Jack, for many you know, was the, was the principal uh, at, at the elementary school. And a, a wonderful guy, and a really good photographer. Uh, not just this picture, this picture. But there's a picture of me in the, in the Chester drum corps uniform, I was the youngest guy at that time, I was, I was thir 13 years old, and the drum went up to, I don't know, right about, it was like a weird plane because I was like so small. <laughs> uh, but we had not that old, old uniform, we had the full, the full leggings, the, 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 ruffle, the ruffle thing, the vest, the wool overcoat, the, yeah. Whoa. the whole thing, and, and you know what, when you're marching and it's really hot out, you don't feel a thing. Huh? When you're when you're playing in a drum corps like that, it's the most amazing thing. You're you're in character, and it's like being on stage. You're just so focused in the moment. It may seem strange, but the bass drummers I always thought had a good time because the first thing I did when I heard about this acquisition, we went running upstairs. And I want to look in, in the percussion hall, 
And what was in the percussion hole? Do you know? Does anyone know what used to be in the percussion holes of those drums? Depends on who made them. Yes, and who, who <laughs> played them. But there were pictures of, of people. <laughs> uh, and uh, that you'd want to show your friends or you just want to, you know, entertain yourself or whatever. But in some of those old, those old, there were pictures or of neat things that the drummers wanted to keep focused on. And so the first thing we did is we looked in there and I think all we saw was the date of the drum was handwritten, I think, 1868. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, there is a picture. Can I just say, with those old uniforms, that's the kind of uniform that I donated, the original lining on the inside was horsehair. Oh, oh, so when you would march, oh. it would pinch you. Oh. Well, this should be more. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Horsehair or something. Yeah, you are. Okay. So the next one now <laughs> reads more about how there's how the society tracks and manages things of value. Again, this is all geared to help explain that we just don't take this stuff in. There's a place for it. We'll find a place for it. If it's something that's really desirable, we'll take care of it in, in, in a, with the property, appropriate humidity and temperature, et cetera. And whatever goes along with that, security systems and the, the fire suppression systems, much greater than what you can do in your house, which is another part of it. If people are thinking about safe and welfare and these, these, these assets here. Well, we'll go on to the next slide here to talk about the software that you're using for the intake. Well, it's a museum type of software called Past Perfect, and most of the big local museums use, use this. And you probably can't see, it's, I didn't get close enough, but it has all the information about when it was donated, who donated it, what it is, uh, the condition, the, the age, and it has pictures with it. And there's other little tabs that you can click on that has more information. But it's also, if you notice of the things over there, everything has a tag and a special number so that we can keep track of everything and where, where it came from and all that sort of stuff. And then you have the process that the store slide goes through in order to actually obtain legal ownership. Is that the right. Document? Which is that document. Um, yeah, we ask everybody to fill out and sign that you're legally giving us the item so that we have custody of it. So. Okay, any questions or comments? Moving right on along to item number three. Uh, Don? There it is. And it's over there. You can bring oh, it up. Oh, sure. First, I have to say, um, thank you for inviting me. This is really nice. Um, it's also. Uh, Great to see Marilyn. I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> and I'm looking over at you from the side. You look like your mother. <laughs> so, uh, John's timing me, which I told him it's not going to work timing me because I can just talk forever. <laughs> but I like it. You know, it's kind of serendipitous that this is here today because um, this particular 1741 document, um, it, it's an amazing story. When my uh, grandmother was town treasurer, she had taken over for John Fuller, Illinois, I think in 1960. And, um, her, Dorothy Ball was the town clerk at the time. And um, it all started, the reason, the reason I know this story is because one day I was staying over at my grandmother's house and it was that big ice storm in like 1974. And I was a little kid at the time, and um, probably 10 years old, and um, we were all iced in. And my grandmother says, well, let's look through this box. And she brings up a couple boxes, and one in particular. And this is the story of Dorothy Ball and my grandmother, and my grandmother's name was Beth, Beth Lucy. And what happened was when they became, both took on that office in the old, you know, the town office building down in the center of town, most people didn't realize that there's a lower level to the vault that was in there. And Carlton Bates had been the town clerk in the first part of the 20th century. And Carlton Bates also had a stationery store, which was, I believe, in one half of Simon, Simon, yeah. And, um, what happened was when he moved into that new building in like 1938, all the stuff went with him, a lot of the stuff from the store. And well, they dumped it in the basement of this. So here's my grandmother and Dorothy Ball. And the first select of the time was George Trabuki. And George said to my grandmother and Dorothy Ball, you need to clean out the downstairs. So they cleaned out the downstairs. And George Trabuki said, just throw everything out that has nothing to do with the town. And, you know, and my grandmother grabbed, you know, Dorothy grabbed a box or two, my grandmother grabbed a box or two, and most of it, it was all stuff related to the, to the stationery business. 
So we're looking through this back in 1974 and looking at all this stuff. Anyway, we're back in the box. My grandmother died, cleaning out the house. I saw this box and I kind of kept it. And I was sentimental. Many years later, 10, 15 years later, I'm going through this box and um, there's an old ledger in the back. The ledger doesn't have anything in it. It's a brand new ledger for the store. And I'm just going to toss it. And just as I toss it, this document kind of slides out the back. Isn't that just incredible? And I know how that was probably in there. I'm guessing is in the 1930s, the state of Connecticut came to all these towns and took their old documents and put facsimiles into, um, into the vaults. So these old documents now are all in the um, Connecticut uh, State Library. But this document's original. How it got in the ledger, I don't know, but I'm guessing it's right around that time. And um, so I immediately took it down to Jack Baker, who did his work with it and put it into this great frame. And I thought I would hang it on the wall. And as soon as I hang it on the wall, I was like, you can't hang it on the wall. It's going to fade. So it sat in the box now for decades. And finally, as I'm kind of cleaning things out, um, I thought it belonged to the Chester Historical Society uh, because it goes along with the great collection. Do I, I do have to make a disclaimer. My wife said that that article in the newspaper that I sounded like a hoarder. But I'm not a hoarder. <laughs> I have a closet in my den where I keep all this stuff. My wife's like thinking we have you know, a little pile in our house, but we don't. But this uh, needs to be here. It's a great uh, document. I love the bottom of it that shows you know, how we're a colony in, you know, in the, what is it, the 15th year of the reign of our sovereign lord, George II. Um, so it's a great document. And Chester is a great collection. Do you know where the land is? I do, you know, Rob could probably look at it and tell you better, but I believe it's in the area near your, your house is. But I, I believe so, but I'm not quite sure. Um, so. Good. Well, I think there's a couple of lessons in, in that that people were thinking about moving it on you know, for every page. <laughs> um, but it's amazing. I mean, look at this. Look, I mean, look at this. This document, the state doesn't have this. I mean, it's, are you going to be criminally prosecuted? No, you're going to be criminally prosecuted. You own it now. He signed the paper. Yeah. 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 Joy, we, we, yeah, is that the oldest thing we own? No, we actually have a couple of deeds that are a little older that came from a branch of the Waters family, Waterhouse family, uh, who I think Don did a... a a video that's up on our yeah. website about it. So there, and of course, one of the oldest things we own are the, like the millstones that are in front of the, yeah. the mill. Right. And some of the deeds, I've forgotten what the, the oldest one was, Donna. You said. 1730s. Yeah. So, but this is among the oldest things. I mean, it's, you know, it was 1741, 42, so that's almost 300 years old. Yeah. I mean, it was that little strange little time warp when they were changing the calendars around so that that's why it has the double numbers on it. Um, okay, we're closing this up with some things to think about. One is, and we didn't talk about this, but it, it falls under the notion of um, uh, well, we were talking earlier about the about the, the, the Betty Peralt button, and and uh, uh, and that's you know and, and, and you've got that kind of stuff, which is when you look at it, and you say, okay, well, is that something that historical society should have? And what 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 do you give? What's the difference between something that's meaningful but not useful in today, but it was useful way back then, and it tells part of the story? What's the what? differentiates that from other stuff. And so when you guys, when we were talking about doing this, I started thinking about what do I have at, at, at home? And I said, oh, here's something else I have. These are match this is a matchbook from the John Farmer house. So I guess that's going to you too. But I mean, where is that? That was downstairs in the basement. Um, there, there are a couple, of, there was an inn at Chester Springs, which I spent a lot of time at when I was working for a company out of town. So they have the Inn at Chester Springs, the Inn at Chester, and I think the Inn at Long Last, or wherever that one is up in Vermont or New Hampshire. And it's just sitting there. I'm realizing, okay, well, those are other matchbooks that you have. 
then I'm wondering, well, is that something that you want? And that's, so that was like a question for me. It's like, what is relevant? You don't have to answer, you can tell me later. <laughs> and then, and then I, I pulled this thing out this afternoon. This is a, a little cocktail napkin from the John D. Parker house, the Unit Chester. That house was 1776. It was a restaurant with a bunch of things. But I'm like, OK, is that relevant? Is that something that you want? Don't answer that question either. <laughs> this is the weird one. This is all. I was the first employee of the char house. Uh, and my job was to first take all the old dairy bottles they were to be used as wine crafts and get the, this is being recorded, uh, mice and everything and everything out of those old bottles so they could be turned into wine crafts. Uh, <laughs> they were sanitized. And, uh, this was my favorite t-shirt. This is my chart house t-shirt. And it got really grungy because I did a lot of grungy things. I, I had just crappy jobs there that eventually I had good jobs, but you had to work from the bottom and that's what I did. And when I was doing the, the lousy stuff, this shirt was getting dirtier and dirtier. For some reason, I kept it, and I kept it, I kept it. And then at one point, I had cut out a piece like this and a piece like this. And then I just found this a couple of days ago. <laughs> this is all that's left. And uh, I don't know, relevant, not relevant, is this an artifact, because it's got the mill and it's got the original logo, or is it just something that uh, I don't think you need to store for 100 years. So John is not the only hoarder in Chester. I guess. <laughs> so you compare that to what you see today, and, you know, and that's really the, the full spectrum. So now the idea is for people to leave here with kind of like thinking, wait a second, this is not just about what stuff comes to us by itself. Is it what's out there that we know about, even in our houses, that really we're not going to take with us, and we're not going to maybe get to the next generation because my kids don't live in town anymore. They don't, and so yeah, a picture of the sign of the unit, the sign of the unit Chester. I have it. What am I going to do with it? Give it to the society because this is where it belongs. That's my feeling, and that's the point of, of a lot of this. Is that once we realize that and we talk about it, it's fun to give because with it is a story. And I'll give you one quick story because we still have about six minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> Just before we, we uh, cut this whole discussion off, like Diane just to talk, sometimes people are reluctant to give but something that is scannable, and if she could just speak to that, uh, those things are a part of our collection as well. I'm sorry. It's scannable. scannable. Oh, yeah. We like the pictures that, that she talked about. I mean, we are always willing to um, take a donation of a bunch of photographs and scan them and then give you back your photographs so that you know you can keep them for your family and we would have copies of them for our, our archives. So um, now is a little, a little piece of this is to then say okay when we leave here today not asking anybody to do anything but uh, keeping it very simple as you go home and you take this card with you. Um, it asks these questions. I'll put this right over here. You, I'm not going to force them on you. You don't have to come in front of the room to get them either. But uh, uh, after the show. But this is very simple. Think about it when you go home and say, what, what items do I have? And let Diane know. Doesn't mean you have to give them. It means maybe she just knows what it is. Maybe it stays in everyone's mind. And maybe when it's time to part with it, it's already thought in advance that this is where it's going to go. Maybe it should go now so it can be kept in good condition. Um, that's really what this society is all about. Um, it's about preserving the past. And what's fascinating as we're all getting older is what used to be history that we were learning about, you know, now we're part of that. So the things that we have early on, I've got something from Joshua Computer Systems. It's my logo that, that uh, Keith Lovell designed when, and, and it's made out of floppy disks. <laughs> yeah. Going like this in a circle that SNAT, I think, stole that with their, <laughs> when they created their, their logo, and they probably used three and a half inch disks at that point. But, I mean, so, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it came out of an advertisement that was in the Pictorial Gazette or someplace. And it's like, it's a sign. I mean, that's like almost, you know, 35 years ago. Is that relevant? Can you tell me, is that relevant? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Is it something that this society wants? It's part of Chester history. 
So there's certain criteria that because we don't have unlimited space, and that's the question too. Uh, but so that anyway, that's the thought for for uh, today is to just be sensitized to these neat things. They all have stories, and I'll close with this one since you left this for me. Um, this came out of the Holden store. Um, there were three of them. And for some reason, I don't have a lot of stuff when I was a kid, but my father and my parents were very busy doing some uh, historic re uh, uh, rehabilitation and, and, and resuscitation on of these buildings. And there's always these stories and about the, 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 the rum runners and people in town, tunnels underneath, things and that. Well, uh, I, I don't know if this should be discounted because it's coming from me and I gave it, but there were three of these in the bottom of One Maple Street. Uh, and when, and when, uh, when I walked into that store, it had been, I guess, shut down for a while, but that was a hardware store at that time, which was 45, 50 years ago, I can't remember. And um, there were three of these jugs, and they didn't look as pretty as this. Uh, 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 and this one had a corn cob still in it. Uh, and the corn cob is long since gone. And of course, the first thing I did is pull the corn cob and stick my nose in there and put it through the smell. But for some reason, I kept it. I have no idea why. And it's just been tossed around from place to place. And then one day, I was just thinking about it. I said, you wouldn't want something like this. Because I, I went on and looked, and you buy these anywhere. You, know, you go around anywhere. Everyone's got these things. But it's the story that comes with it. It's part of the, it's part of the thing. Now, you said you wanted it, so here's the, I guess it must be the document that, that talks about it. It's the story. Uh, here's the story that I just gave you, and I should have read it to see if I was telling the truth, but it's okay, you can read it yourself. But I mean, we have things like this, and, and, and uh, I guarantee you that a lot of us have stuff at home that's very relevant. So if you take a look at that card, you'll see it's just asking, well, what do you have, and what about your, what's interesting, and then take a picture, or shoot it, whatever, get the plan and call, and maybe we'll start building up a database of things that we'd like to have and get the party and the discussions to happen because it's much easier if we know something is out there and people said, oh, we tried to get that from someone and that doesn't mean we'll have to go out and attack people, but um, if we know about it, it might be some easier discussions that some people can have that other people can have to try to loosen things up, especially if they reconsider the role of the historical society versus what it was you know, when we first started. We didn't have any of this kind of uh, curatorial capability. Well, now we do, so maybe we need to communicate it. And that's what this is for, that's what this is about, and uh, thank you for letting me be part of uh, today's presentation.